Welcome, Soundies, to our Sound for Video session, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's great to have you here. Today is the 18th of September, 2022. Um, apologies, I got the date wrong in the email I sent out yesterday, but in fact, it is today, the 18th. So thanks for joining us. Hope everybody's doing well out there. Um, for those that are interested, and if you haven't seen it already, we did put up a review of the DJI mic. It's a little consumer-grade wireless microphone system, two transmitters, dual-channel receiver. Um, competes with the Rode Wireless Go 2. It's, uh, it's uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's a clear answer between which of those two is better. Um, they each have kind of a different set of strengths and weaknesses, but... Um, if that's of use, that you'll find that over on my main channel, Curtis Judd. Okay, today we're doing things a little differently. As you can see, we're in a different space here. Um, Danny is still is uh, still our producer. Hi, Danny. Hi. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? Good. Good. Thanks so much for uh, doing the switching and stuff for us today. I appreciate that. My pleasure. All right. Um, we are working with uh, just uh, just out of care for people that are curious. Um, and I hesitate to do this sometimes because sometimes uh, some people get the wrong impression that like, oh, you're flexing with your expensive gear. But um, we are using the Allen & Heath SQ5 mixer. That's what's just right down here in front of me today. Um, running four channels. So right now you're hearing the Earthworks SV33 microphone. We also have just up here, this is the Sennheiser MKE, or sorry, MKH416 shotgun microphone just here. And then we've got another boom microphone over here that we'll use a little later. Um, that's the uh, DPA 4017B, but that's going to be for demonstrating our boom swinger, which we'll come to in just a minute. And then, of course, Danny is on the KSM-8. So we've got four channels going today, plus um, we're running the music from the phone right into the mixer. You're not on. Do you want to be on? For just 10 seconds. Okay, talk to us. Hi. And it's good you can't see the basement floor because it's covered in cables. Yeah, well, it's a... Yeah. This is a temporary setup, so <laughs> uh, we uh, we wanted to be. I, I needed to be out here to show the boom swinger and how that works, so um, that's why we switched it up today. Before we get to the boom swinger, I want to talk about one other thing. So, Danny, if you want to switch to our iPad here, um, there is something that, and I think it was Liam that pointed this out to me. Uh, maybe in a cup, a couple of you actually pointed this out, but Adobe. I think I don't know if Adobe. Oh, I'm going to switch back over to my other mic here just a second. Okay, there is the SV33 again. Uh, I don't know if Adobe bought this company or if it's just an internal project, but they have a project called Shafta, and the idea is to create uh, is, is AI-powered audio recording and editing on the web. So um, the idea here is that you could make a recording with, say, for example, just talking into your smartphone, uh, record that maybe to a WAV file. You could record it to MP3 or AAC as well. I, I'm not sure. I, the details are not clear to me yet. Um, I did sign up. To, I requested access, so as soon as they grant me access, then I'll, I'll start playing with it and have more information on that. But the idea is that you could record into your phone or anything, take that file, drop it into an interface here on the web, and it will actually process that. And with artificial... <laughs> I, I, I hesitate. They call it artificial intelligence. I don't think it's really... There's a nuance there. I'm not sure it's actually artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> but whatever it is, machine learning, um, other algorithms that they're using to process the audio and make it sound like it was recorded in, in, in a studio, even if it wasn't recorded in a studio. So the samples I've heard, of course, so far sound amazing, but, you know... Usually marketing stuff sounds amazing. Uh, here are a couple things here. They have another thing too. One of the things they've added to Premiere Pro recently is a speech to text. Um, we saw that actually last week when we looked at uh, Isotope RX as well. I think it works a little bit better in Premiere if you're a Premiere editor. But the idea here is you could also select, uh, you know, paragraphs, if you will, or sentences and be able to, to cut there. Um, it'll also have remote recording capability. And it will also have some features that, uh, for example, get mic checked here. They show um, to kind of help you optimize. So for people, especially if you're working with guests who are not necessarily audio enthusiasts or don't have a lot of experience with audio, it will help them to 
sort of optimize their setup and optimize their sound, encouraging them to get a little bit closer to the microphone, for example, and um, change the gain settings. So anyway, uh, we'll have more on that as we learn more. I have requested access. I think there's also, from my point of view, a little bit of a privacy concern. I don't, I looked through a little bit of the privacy policy for Adobe. Um, it's not really clear to me, you know, how how they can use your audio if you do upload it. So more to, more to come there, but that's uh, just something I wanted to run by you there. Okay, so let's come back out and let's talk about our next topic here. Before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, it's been a couple of years, well, a number of years now, three, four years. I think it was 2018 maybe. Um, I was hired to do a job, so there was a little piece that was... Um, was produced by a company called REI. So REI makes recreational, what, what does REI stand for? Recreational Equipment Incorporated or something? Do you know, Danny? That sounds right. Yeah, something like that. Um, they were So they commissioned a piece. There was a, a professor at the university along with a grad student that was working on a program of research where they were trying to find a relationship between spending people spending time in the outdoors um, and what that did to their brains, um, how it affected their brain activity. And so they had done this research, so they hired a team, so there was a producer, or sorry, a director, I think there was a crew of two or three that came out from Los Angeles. Um, they hired Levi, my friend, as a DP. At, the, at his recommendation, he hired a second camera operator, and then for me for sound. So it was probably like a $30,000 budget or something, relatively small production. But um, we went up to this uh, place by the university to do the filming. And it was a, it was a, it was a one day. Yeah, it was a one day thing. Um, and the producer had a shot, you know, obviously the director had a shot list. And um, we had a couple of local producers that came out as well. At one point, they wanted to go it was in these gardens behind the university and they wanted to walk up into the forest a little bit, the forested area in the back and do an interview with one of the, with a, I think it was the grad student. No, it was, the, it was the, it was the professor and they had hired a host as well. So that's another person that they had hired. Um, and it was going to be like a quarter of a mile. So uh, I had everyone loved up, but I also had my boom mic and because it was a quarter mile, I was like, okay, I don't think I want to bring the C stand with the little boom arm, you know, the boom hook. Actually, it would have to be two because it was an interview. So I opted instead, okay, I'll just, I'll hand boom this one. Because <laughs> I didn't want to carry two C stands. We didn't have enough production assistance to help with that. So in any case, um, I just walked back there. It turned out that the take was about an 18 minute take. Um, and I would challenge anyone to hold a boom pole for 18 minutes straight and see how your arms feel. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, fortunately, because I'm so tall, I was able to um, kind of tuck my arms in and do this for a lot of it. Um, so that helped some, but nevertheless, it was, a, it was a really long take. And one of the things that would have been really useful is to have something that was a little bit more portable that would allow me to, to carry that up. And that's where... The boom buddy comes in so this was sent over in full disclosure this was sent over from mitchell who who runs this company called boom buddy and danny if you want to cut to the uh, the other camera here so boom buddy um and this product is called the boom swinger and here's the idea this is what it looks like right here um so we've got a metal bracket here a 3 8 inch uh threaded tap there two rollers and the idea is that you place your boom pole in between these two, you attach this to another boom pole or a monopod or something like that, and then this sits vertically, the, the, that monopod or boom pole sits vertically with its end against the ground, and then that can support the boom pole. So you basically put the fulcrum of the, the boom pole here in the rollers, and then you can cue back and forth, and that will take a lot of that weight off um, and also allow you to... Um, to cue back and forth between actors or participants in the in the filming. So let's go ahead and demonstrate that for you. So Dan, if you want to cut back to the main camera here. Um, let me go grab a boom pole. This is actually, I have an older boom pole. It's a Rode. Do you remember Rode's aluminum boom poles? They're, I think, a, 
I don't remember how much they cost. They're not terribly expensive. They're not the greatest boom poles, but it's perfect for this situation. So let me grab that. Okay, so we've got this a 3 8 inch uh, thread on the top, and all you do is put this on there. That's uh, cinching it down against the, sort of a rubber washer there. So it looks like that now. And again, the idea is we just place the boom right in here, and then I can cue back and forth, and I can move it as well. So I've got a, a pretty good range of motion. So with that, let me show that to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute this microphone and go get the boom, and then I'll unmute the boom mic and show you what it sounds like. And I've, I've gained it up so that it should be good for normal dialogue levels. And I want to kind of cue it back and forth a little bit and see if you can hear any of the movement. That's going to be the critical thing for something like this is, is it going to be good in terms of preventing any sort of vibrations that would carry into the microphone. Obviously your shock mount should mitigate a good bit of that, but um, let's see how it does. So we're gonna mute here. Okay, so here I am now on the this is the uh, 4017B, the DPA, on this boom mic here. I'm kind of chopped off, I realize that, but let's go ahead and let's uh, demonstrate what this would, would work, how this would work. Okay, so that's the idea. I'm curious if you were able to hear any handling noise for reference. Just uh, so you can hear what that sounds like. So yeah, let us know in the chat. Curious. I'm going to go ahead and mute here for a second while I switch back over. Okay, so that's uh, just a quick look at the Boom Swinger. Um, we put a link for that down below. It's not an affiliate link or anything. It's just, uh, you can get those at Gotham Sound, and I believe they're $38 US. So pretty interesting little piece, uh, little invention, um, clever. And I think this would be really useful in the future for me. In those situations where we're going to be doing those longer takes <laughs> and uh, need to be able to power through those. So, all right, let's go to the chat here, see if we have any questions or what anyone's thoughts are. I'm gonna put this back over here. Oh, okay. Definitely some handling noise. Um, okay. Let me ask you this, was there any handling noise when I was handling it without the boom swinger? Wait, 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 wait. Go ahead, Danny. Uh, somebody says, that seems really good, no big difference from me, from normal handling noise. Yeah, that's about the same for me. That's what my impression was as well. Thanks for that, Andy. Would handling be reduced a little if boom was fully extended? Maybe. Um, that's a good point. So here, obviously, we had we were constrained in terms of space. Um, we'll do some further tests, but um, yeah, that, that could change things a little bit because, uh, you know, the fulcrum will be a little different. The weight, um, they'll probably be bearing down a little bit more, maybe. In any case, Christopher also says minor handling noise without the boom swinger. Okay. 
There was some handling noise without the boom swinger. Yes, so a little bit on each side. So I my, my overall impression was that it didn't change. I mean, there was handling noise both ways. <laughs> so um, I don't think it was the, the boom swinger maybe, maybe was adding a little bit more. I don't know. I have to go back and listen to that really carefully, but... Um, that could definitely solve a problem for me too, though. So just wanted to demonstrate that as a potential tool for those that are out doing production sound. Okay. We have more comments. All right, let's see them. It is a pity you cannot make forward movement with the boom swinger. Um, well, you, you, yeah, so it doesn't roll, the, the pole doesn't roll that direction. It only twists. So... Um, you can lean forward, so you do have a little bit of, of area that you can cover. So if an actor were to move just a little bit, you could still, I think you could still adapt to that. And you can lift it up if you needed to. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be generally for more static shots. So it's not going to be if you're moving around a whole lot. Again, for me, the, the, the point is for those longer shots, and those are usually going to be standing in place or, or even perhaps sitting in place. Is the handling noise coming from the pole being in contact with the floor? Uh, no, it's it's mostly coming from my hands and from the, um, yeah, it's mostly my hands touching the pole. That's what most of it is. I've never had any problem with mine. Definitely an arm saver. Oh, John. Okay. Looks like John's used it before. So, yeah, uh, possible, again, potential tool there that can help on those long takes. Thanks, John. I wonder if the noise could have been cut down by having a thinnish felted filament between the two prongs to rest it on. Well, those are kind of rubberized wheels. Let me just, um, let's come back to that camera again, Danny, really quickly here. So these are kind of rubber wheels, basically, hard rubber wheels, and they spin. And so that's the idea is that they spin so that um, you can move the pole or twist the pole and cue back and forth between the talents. So I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, I would I would be concerned that the, these are stiff enough that if you tried to put some sort of felt over these, that the pole would slip. And then you'd hear the of the pole rubbing against the, um, the felt. So that would have to be a different design altogether, I would think. Okay. All right, Mark says, would be interested to know if different boom pole material makes a noise difference while using it. Good question. So I'm using a, that was a K-Tech pole. It's a graphite pole. Um, also, if you're interested in, if you wanted to see more detail and more examples, uh, my friend Alan Williams on his channel, Sound Speeds on YouTube, also did a review of this some time back. He uses um, ambient poles. And the ambient poles are actually carbon fiber, so it is a different material than graphite. So if, um, if you'd like to get some more samples, you could see some of those there. Christopher, where is Alan's super boom stud? <laughs> he's um, probably booming right now. I know he's working yesterday uh, based on what I saw on his Twitter channel. I used to hold a boom for 80 minutes straight until the cards in the camera run out, moving at the same time. Flex. I have the boom swinger and it is absolutely brilliant. I'm looking forward to using my little, a little bit more, see how that goes. Thanks, John. Audio buff, I love seeing tools of the trades. Thanks for showing. You bet. The pleasure is all mine. Looks like a helpful tool, but it seems like it'd take a long time to set up on a quickly moving set. Uh, far less time, actually, than a than a C stand. <laughs> I could set this up quicker than a C stand if I had, uh, if you know, if I had the equipment nearby. So I just run back to the cart, get the other boom pole. You saw how quickly I was able to twist this on, and we were in business. So uh, Matt says I was in the exact same situation. I used to. I once used an oversized mic holder on a mic stand. And it worked. I assume that I worked. I did put a micro cloth around the boom. Yeah, so it's sort of an improvised version of this. 
good. Christopher. By the way, it's great that Danny has a fully active mic today with an auto mixer like the SQ has. This should be the norm going forward. Well, thank you for setting the standard. <laughs> I do not have the auto mixer set on right now. Danny, you're still there, yeah? I'm still here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We're manually mixing. Okay. That is all that we have uh, right now on that topic. So let's, uh, let's go to the chat for general questions. We did not have anybody submit a question ahead of time that I saw. Let me just double check really quickly, see if anyone snuck one in the last minute. I actually did get a ton of questions on the DJI mic, um, but not any questions ahead of time. So let's see what we've got here. A, a public service announcement. A public service announcement. Very good. From Christopher. Not directly related to audio, but in light of the Uber hack, anyone, everyone, please go get a FIDO2 security key and update your important accounts to use it for multi-factor authentication. SMS and TOTP are not secure. Okay. Thanks for that. I actually, for my YouTube channel, I definitely have a, a key that I use, which I think is good. Um, yeah, no, no other questions that were submitted. Um, so, Mitchell, Mitchell, are you there? If you are in the in the live stream, love to hear any other insights you have, any uh, suggestions. So, Mitchell, I believe is the inventor or the creator of the boom swinger. Um, would love to hear. I think also, um, Boom Buddy has some other products too. I'm not I'm not as familiar with those, but. In any case. Okay, question from Shoji. If you were purchasing your first boom mic to record an indoor interview, what boom mic would you recommend? MKH416, MKH50, or MKH60? Hmm, probably the 50 for indoors. If I'm going to do mostly indoors, I would probably do the 50. That would be my take. Um, keep in mind, the 50 doesn't sound great out of the just directly with some voices. I mean, that's true of any mic, most mics. Um, but uh, for on my voice, it sounds pretty harsh. It's got a lot of mid range. It seems like it's a little bit more mid forward, I think. Um, but I, it's a lovely mic in many other ways. Also that high pass filter, I wouldn't typically use that. It's too aggressive. I would use, if you're going to high pass, I would do it on your mixer as opposed to that, that inbuilt one. It's like 250 Hertz is its center frequency. So it's a little bit much, but other than that, uh, the MKH 50 is a brilliant mic. 416 could work too. I want to talk about that actually for just a minute. The whole This whole thing about using shotgun microphones indoor, they can work fine indoors if you are, uh, you know, if you get it on axis. If you get it off axis, that's where things can get a little dicey. I'm trying to see if I could demonstrate here. I don't think I I'm not really equipped to do that. I've got this massive stand here that I can't adjust. But the idea is that with a boom mic or a shotgun microphone in particular, what I've found is if you get off axis, if the microphone is not aimed at the sound source and you start getting sound in the um, through the interference tube at the same time or at a similar time that it's coming in the front of the microphone, that's when it tends to get really odd and you start to get this warbling sound. Um, it's, it's essentially um, comb filtering. So that's the biggest issue. Um, and if you're in a really reverberant space, that can sometimes be funky. Um, if the sound is slapping off the wall and getting into the side really, really quickly, if you're close to that wall or if it's a really reflective surface, that's where I run into those problems the most. You're not going to have those problems with something like the MKH50 because it doesn't have the interference tube design. So that's my thought there. All right. What about an AT4053B for indoor booming? I think that's a fine choice as well. In fact, that was my first... Um, it's the Audio Technica. That was my first kind of serious uh, boom microphone. It's a hypercardioid. It's a little bit, a little bit more directional in some ways than most super cardioids like the MKH50. But um, it was a brilliant mic for me. I've used it. I used it a lot. I even used it outdoors in a in a wind cover on uh, one production in particular called Homeless, um, and you can find that on YouTube if you search Homeless Uphill Cinema. You will find that and you'll hear an AT4053B used outdoors on the street for interviews. 
All right, it would be better if those balls move in all directions so that we can actually boom forward too. Mm. Let me let me just show something here. Let me let me set this back up again. I'm going to mute this for just a second. Let me just show you something. So what I wanted to demonstrate there is there is a fair bit of mobility. Remember, you can you can lean that thing around, and obviously I'm I don't have the pole extended as far as I typically would. Um, but you do have some mobility, so um, I think there's some advantages to not. Uh, first of all, that would make a much more complex design to support something like that. It would have to be gravity that would hold those balls in, um, and I'm not sure what rolling. The less rolling you can do, the better. <laughs> so from my point of view, it's actually a pretty nice, pretty elegant, simple design as it is. And you do have some mobility backwards and forwards. So um, I think it actually is a pretty nice design as it is. All right, uh, Christopher, was audio unmuted during that mic swing demo just now? No, it wasn't. I did not turn it on. I can do it again if you like. Let's do it. Stand by. Okay, now we have the boom mic unmuted. There's going to be a little bit of noise there. Oh, that was my bad. <laughs> bad technique there. Okay, when I put this in the holder, I want to mute it just a little bit. Actually, there's no such thing as muting a little bit. Muting is muting. I wanted to fade it back just a little bit. What was that, Danny? I was wondering what you meant by muting just a little bit. <laughs> it's not a thing. Definitely not a thing. So, Christopher, hopefully that is uh, illustrative of what you were wondering about there. There was some bad technique there, but I was getting too aggressive, and so. All right, Darren says the boom swinger will definitely help my short old arms. <laughs> it's gonna help my ridiculously long arms too. Uh, zombie rig from this is even more lazy than the boom swinger. What's that? Zombie rig, oh, zombie rig from Tilta is even more lazy than the boom swinger. <laughs> I haven't seen that one. Maybe I should look that up. Tilta zombie rig, you say? Hmm, I'll have to do some more research on that. It's, I see some videos, but it looks like a shoulder rig of some sort. Anyway, I'll have to look at that closer. Okay. Christopher, thanks for redoing with audio on. You are most welcome. Thanks for asking. 
Mark. Seemed that any noise was cable from the boom and not the boom swinger. Yeah, so that's an internal coiled cable in that particular boom mic. And uh, yeah, there's definitely some transfer of that. Just a question about lav connectors. Which connector is the most versatile? I've been thinking about upgrading my lav mics and I've been considering micro dot in the input. Well, micro dot is probably the most versatile because you can usually get adapters for most other systems. But um, yeah, it's frustrating that every system seems to have its own, at least in the pro realm. In the consumer realm, it's almost always 3.5 millimeter TRS. Um, in the pro realm, it's not only are there different connectors, so there's three pin, Limo, uh, four pin, I think there's five pin, um, and some of them are wired differently. So Audio Limiteds, or what is now Sound Devices, is a three pin, but I think it's wired differently than some other manufacturers that also use three pin. <laughs> so uh, it's, yeah, it's really confusing. I think Microdot's the simplest. The, the challenge with Microdot is that that adds a little bit more fragility to the overall connector there not quite as durable necessarily um, and they're they tend to be bigger because you're using an adapter and then connecting that to the micro dot so there's a little bit of a cost there but if you want if you are going to be switching between wireless systems then micro dot can make some sense i do have some micro dot on some of mine my dpa 4160 and uh countryman b6 both have micro dot connectors and adapters curious what other people's thoughts are so micro dot is kind of a mixed in short micro dot's a mixed blessing gives you more versatility um, but it does make things a little bit it's another connection point that can potentially fail and those adapters are not cheap they're they you know it's not uncommon for them to be 60 to 80 dollars us or even 100 and some dollars us depending on the adapter all right i am in the same situation ended up passing on micro dot Horror stories with all brands of micro dot adapters to wireless transmitter. Yeah, there's it's not it's not a good it's not a get out of jail free. It's a get out of jail with cost. <laughs> Somebody posted bond. Um, so it's not perfect. What's up? There's a lot of conversation about that, but people people can look in the chat. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so a lot of mixed feelings about Microdot. I mean, ideally, you'll get the what for you know terminated for the system you're going to be using. It's the main idea. Harry, uh, I'm wearing Audio Technica headphones with volume up. I could hear rumbling like distant thunder rumbles when it was moved far forward and backwards. Okay, that could well be air moving across the capsule. I do have the foam cover on, but foam covers aren't perfect. So there's some of that, definitely. Liberty Dude, when using the Boom Buddy with the control balls only going sideways, it does allow in reason to use the setup without holding the monopod, two hands controlling the actual boom. Ah, okay. As long as you keep it rested uh, firmly within that, that's interesting. Good, good input. Thanks for that. that the, at least you could, for example take the one hand off and make adjustments if you're wearing your mixer in a bag. Curtis, do you use in your YouTube recording workflow Atomos recorders? I used to. Um, back when I was filming mainly with hybrid cameras, I did a lot. Nowadays, I don't as much because, um, I mean, I still have my original Ninja 2, <laughs> which is a horrible screen on that, that recorder. And I also have the original Shogun. Um, at work, we do use the Ninja Inferno and the, sh the newer Shogun. We do use them at work some, but um, no, typically for my YouTube videos, I don't anymore. I just don't have a need to. I'm using my main camera as a Canon C70, which is what you're seeing here today. Uh, and its codec is really quite good, so I don't generally need to use an external recorder. So that kind of just simplifies my setup. However, if I were ever to... to um, use hybrid cameras again, like a so you know, Sony Alpha or something like that, I think uh, probably an Atomos recorder would be the first thing I'd turn to. Make things simpler that way. Microdot are so easy to break. That's a thing that's interesting about productions. Like if you're just doing your own little things in your own studio and you're taking care of your gear, 
Microdot can be just great uh, for the most part. Uh, <laughs> when you get on a production set, things go crazy. Um, you know, when I'm running around and I have four plus, you know, and actually that's not even that many. If you talk to production sound mixers that do this professionally, you know, more often than I do, um, they're wiring up easily 10, 12 people every production day. And, you know, actors are going to the bathroom uh, and, you know, having to move around wardrobe. And so it's just, there's so many things that can happen. People drop the transmitter when they're changing. Um, it just, and then you've got the transmitter swinging while the lavalier microphone is concealed. And it just, a lot of stress placed on those. And uh, that's where micro dot connectors have a tendency to kind of fall down, tend tendency to break in those situations. So on the other hand, I haven't had any fail yet. Had to have just retighten them. Um, would you be watching the Queen's funeral tomorrow? Uh, I do have to work tomorrow, so I will not be watching the Queen's funeral tomorrow. But... Um, my condolences to her family. Um, let's see here. Danny, could you read that one for me, please? Yes. So we have, I figured that the Zoom H8 does not have a solo function, and Zoom has not actually mentioned this, and no one on internet or YouTube has actually revealed it. I wanted this to be noted. Hmm. Very good. Thank you for that. Yeah. So that's the thing with those handheld record, the handy recorders in particular, is they're not really set up the same way as they're made for simplicity of use. They are not necessarily modeled after traditional mixers and they don't solo is one thing that they did not include. So yeah, it's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Shoji, since you have used both, what are the differences in sound between the AT4053B and the MKH50? They're pretty similar. I actually have a video where we compared the two of them. And I think if you go, I think it's if, if you look up, uh, hmm, let me take a look here. YouTube. And Curtis Judd Sennheiser MKH 50. I have the Sennheiser MKH50 review, but then I also have a 600 versus 1200. So if you do a search for Curtis Judd 600 versus $1,200 microphone, you will find a comparison. You can actually hear the two of them right next to each other. They sound different. Um, we call it a blind comparison, I believe. Um, I think look in the, in the description to see which is which. <laughs> All right, Matt says, I have just stuck with Shure and overall that has worked well. Um, yeah, I think depending on the type of um, sound you're doing, Shure didn't have much of a presence in the film world for quite a while there, number of years, but they're now making uh, their way back into that room, that space. Lots of live, Shure is probably one of the, the forefront, uh, one of the most common in live sound reinforcement for sure. So. Um, but yeah, Shure makes great wireless systems. I've always been impressed with them. Jonathan, has anyone used Sonal? Actually, Danny, if you could read that for me, please. Has anyone used Sonal SHX 800? If so, what does it compare? How does it compare to Audio Technica ATH M20X regarding sound and over-the-ear comfort? Okay. Uh, I'm not familiar with that model. Let me go look that up. It might be the one that is supposed to be like the Sony's, but I'm not sure. Sonal SHX. These are headphones we're talking about here. 800. And... Just pulling those up here. Just take a look at those. No, those are different. I think those are different than the, the so they Sonal in essence is making headphones that are modeled after other very popular sets of headphones. And I, th if I had to guess, 
I don't know if those if that's the set that's modeled after the um I think these actually might be the ones modeled after the Sony MDR 7506s. I'm not sure, but if those are the ones, I actually found them to be in terms of comfort, uh, it depends entirely on your ears and your head. Um that is such a personal thing. It's really hard to say. I mean, people can say and share their opinions, but the reality is, is that everyone's head and everyone's ears are different. So that's going to be very, very personal. Um, if that's the same set I was thinking of, these are pretty similar to the MDR 7506s, but the sound signature is different. And I actually found that the sound signature on the SHX 800s were a, a little bit more they weren't quite as colored as the 7506s. 7506s are great. And to, taking a step back, philosophy on headphones. <laughs> uh, there are lots of quality headphones out there. They all do sound different. To a large extent, the game is figuring out using a single set enough and getting used to them so that you can, so your mind, your brain gets used to that particular sound signature and you can work with it. You can ju make judgments based on that. Um, and those actually, to me, sounded a little bit, just like right off the bat, sounded a little bit more even. Not that perfectly even is always the goal from my point of view, but, and in fact, there are some people, I think uh, Alan Williams is one of them, who intentionally uses the 7506 knowing that they're not flat um, because it, 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 it has some hype <laughs> in some of the frequencies that are really useful for finding potential issues. Um, so, and that's, that's actually generally what I found. I do use the 7506s when I'm doing production sound some or location sound, and they are pretty good at helping you find, um, some of those issues. They're not flat, definitely not flat though. So I probably beat that question to death, Jonathan. I hope that helps a little bit. <laughs> I don't know how they compare to the uh, Audio-Technicas. Is there a post-production software that does what Mix Assist does? Yes, Clayton, um, there is. And we uh, looked at it a while back. If you do a search for WT Auto Mixer, Curtis Judd, um, in a sound for video session sometime back, we actually did a little demonstration of that. So that is something worth checking out. It's less expensive than Mix Assist as well. And you can use it in post, of course. Um, which is better for acoustic instrument recording between the Shure MV7 dynamic mic and a Samson CO1 condenser mic? Um, I don't know, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't do acoustic music recording typically. Not a lot. Um, and I haven't used the Samson CO1. Bandrew Scott over at Podcastage would probably have a little bit more insight into that, and some other people here may also as well. Sure, MV7 is an interesting mic. I um, I don't know if it would be my first choice if I if I were getting into acoustic music recording. I'm not sure that would be the one I would choose. I'd probably choose a condenser. I'd want some of that. I wouldn't want something that was so dark, necessarily, unless you're working with an instrument that's really bright and it needs to be tamed some, but... Those are some initial thoughts there. Okay. Another question. Do you think you will be testing the Deity TCSL1 slate? Um, don't know. I, I tested the timecode boxes. Uh, the the TCSL1 slate, I believe, has been delayed some due to some manufacturing supply chain things. Um, but I'd love to. Sure, would love to try it. Looks looks like they've put a lot of thought into it. Um, uh, Matt Ruff, even sure has a split between TA4 and Limo 3 <laughs> in terms of the connectors, and that can be frustrating indeed. Um, I can't talk about the details, but Sure did send me a set of lavalier microphones to demo, which we'll be demoing here probably in the next four weeks or so. Um, and now we're trying to source a wireless system that works with the <laughs> particular connectors they sent with they sent it because, um, yeah, frustrating. Um, which one do I pick? Is the question? Yeah, I I think I, I would. Do you mean which wireless system should you check? Should you pick? No, no, no. This is... Go ahead. 
this is part of the conversation. Okay. It's just kind of, that's the general feel of the conversation. Got it. Okay. On those, I guess it's connectors. Is that right? Yeah. The connectors okay. or the terminations. Yep. Yep. It's not a straightforward answer. I would, I would focus more on what wireless system you'll be using and then, then choose your microphones and the terminations. Well, thank you, Matt, uh, for the super chat. Haven't given to the coffee fund for a while. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. And that'll uh, keep us going here for a while. <laughs> Hope everything is going well for you out there in Music City, Nashville. Danny's scouring the chat there today. We have, am I on? You're on. Yeah. There are several qu several conversations going on at the same time, so I'm sorting through those. Danny's working her way through. Okay. All right, from AudioBuff, I use the 7506 in live mixing because they are very bright and can help me hear in a loud environment. Ah, very good. That makes sense. Um, and there, there, that's the thing that too, there are sound signature that a lot of people have worked a lot with, so they know it. Um, and it, a big, a big piece of it is knowing the sound signature, to be honest, that's like a, that makes a huge, huge difference. And so if it's something you're familiar with, that can make it a lot easier for, for those situations. There are, there are uh, the movie Interstellar, the production sound mixer used uh, Sony MDR 7506s, recording all of that. So, and I just listed a Christopher Nolan movie. I don't know if that was the best choice. <laughs> They're used on a lot of movies. All right, Darren, have you seen used Nuriva's microphone mist device? Interesting tech if it works. I have not even heard of this. Tell us about it. Mariva, let's just do Nuriva microphone mist. Is this like a uh, let's see here? Let me just make this available here. Danny's over there giggling, not sure why. If you want to switch over to the iPad here. Revolutionary for a reason. For years, conference call technology was stuck, having leaving frustrated users hoping for the kind of breathtaking or breakthrough that has transformed other sectors. Microphone mist technology is that breakthrough. It fills a room with virtual microphones so everyone can be heard everywhere in a space and remote callers feel like they're in the room with the team. Uh, a virtual microphone is an individual pickup point created when two or more physical microphones work together to focus their sound pickup on a distinct zone. Microphone mist technology listens to each virtual mic simultaneously and optimizes each one for a natural listening experience. Um, okay, so it does some beam forming as well. Intelligent sound. Okay, so it looks like these are the microphones up here. Um, I don't know if you can see that here. I can make it bigger. Whoa, hey, quit, quit moving on me. There we go. So these up here are evidently microphones. Or wait, is that supposed to be HVAC? And the microphones are canceling that? I don't know. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, yeah. So preemptively identifies unwanted sounds like HVAC and simply stops picking them up. What I'm curious about is, uh, so it's more of an installation type thing. Um, pretty cool. If it, you know, depend, it'd be interesting to hear how it works. But where are those microphones is my question. I'd be curious to know how they set that up. Hmm. Thanks for letting us know about it. New Riva is, I guess, how you say that. Cool. Thanks for the tip. Be interesting to learn more about that. Okay, we'll switch on back over to our main microphone, or main camera here. Anything else there in the chat, Danny? There's a lot. 
There's a lot in the chat. Back <laughs> up. Making our way through. Oh, here's one. Okay. Bonjour. I have a Zoom F6 and was surprised to have to set the clock date back almost every time I powered up. Is something? Is this something you experience too? Yes. Um, I'm not 100% sure in the F6 if that's a rechargeable battery, but I think um, once that in, there's an internal battery that keeps the clock going, and if that battery runs out, the clock stops when you have it powered off. So, I, I in in the professional uh, recorders, the higher end ones, I know they typically have a like a rechargeable lithium ion. So when you power it on, it's using the battery, the external battery that you're using to power the unit to power up that little internal battery. So that next time you turn it off, it can keep that clock going for some period of time. Now, there's also, this is a different matter. This is just a real-time clock. I'm not talking about the time code generator clock. That's a that's a different matter, too. Those can only be powered for, those usually have internal batteries, too. But in any case, yes, I think that's a, yes, with the Zoom F6, I experience that. With the Zoom F8, I experience that. I experience it with all of them. Um, the Mix Pre tends, as and my experience has done better with that. And I don't know what the difference is in terms of what kind of batteries they're using inside those devices. But my suspicion is that they're using either a smaller or a lower quality battery in the Zoom F series. Just a guess. But yeah, that's pretty typical. Uh, Bandrew will say a condenser is better than a dynamic for acoustic. That would be kind of my bias too. Typically I'd want to use a condenser microphone for an acoustic instrument. Uh, sure SM57, great mic for live music. That's been used for decades for live music. Um, we bought one for Danny, so when she performs live, she's got that as a as an option. It's a, it's a sound signature that's been used a lot. Thanks for your answer. Like your channel. Thanks so much. Thanks for the question. Marcus, uh, do you have a recommendation between the various external power options for the Mix Pre 62 for connecting to a V mount? Um, Hiroshi, L mount, sled, etc. Um, I have with the Mix Pre, the small Mix Pre's, the, 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 the 10 is different because it does have the Hiroshi input. Um, but it, yeah, if you want to, if you want it, the battery sled that has the Hiroshi input, good option there. Not cheap, but good option. Um, I think that was, was it um, Hawk Woods that made the battery sled that had both a slot for a Sony uh, L-series battery, NPF battery, and it had a Hiroshi input. That would be kind of like the best of both worlds. Um, I haven't used that particular one, but that's an option. And then just a big USB battery bank can power that mix pre for quite a while as well. So... That's what I actually used when I had the Mix Pre 6, and that worked pretty nicely. If you keep it in the bag, I didn't have any issues with the cables pulling out, so the nice thing about that too is that you can also keep a battery pack on there in case the, the, USB, the USB connector did get pulled out, and that way it would still be powered on. But um, yeah, I just used um, Anchor, an Anchor uh, battery bank. You're going to need one that's power delivery capable to power the Mix Pre 6 too, but um, those are pretty common these days. And actually probably, you can probably get into a pretty good one for less than a V-mount battery maybe. So I guess it really just depends on how much money you want to spend. Have you reviewed the Aston mics, uh, the Spirit or Origin? I have not. Um, no, I have not. I know, ba I think pretty sure Bandrew has over on Podcastage. Bandrew won't review the Samson CO1s until they are vintage mics. It is a running joke with a longtime supporter. The CO1s are closer to super cardioid polar pattern too. Hmm, interesting. Hey, can you share any DIY ideas for hiding a lav mic, something which you think is actually underrated? Well... Um, I don't, I don't have any like secrets on that. Um, I, I will say that I use the, um, moleskin sandwich a lot. So I use moleskin and, 
a bigger piece on the back, then the microphone, and then a smaller piece on the front. Oftentimes we'll attach that to the underside of the clothing so that when it moves, it moves against the skin. That's one potential option. You can do the inverse of that, connect it to the skin, and the clothing can move across it, but that tends to pick up clothing rustle. Um, hiding under, you know, where you can conceal it between, like the, 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 with the corporate video work I used to do, I would often use my DPA 4160, which actually has a buttonhole concealer. Uh, so you could actually stick it pretty easily in the buttonhole without people having to get undressed or open up their shirts or anything like that. So that was nice. And that worked pretty well. I, um, depending on the clothing they were wearing, the fabric, you, that one wouldn't pick up too much clothing noise because it would move with the clothing. Um, so that was one of my favorites actually to use when I was doing the corporate work. Um, if you're going to put something like in a t-shirt under the collar, um, I oftentimes find if you move it off to the side a little bit, that can actually help as opposed to right here. Right here can tend to sound really throaty. You move it off to the side a little bit, that can help make it a little easier to EQ and post. That's something worth considering. And of course, when you hide it in a, on a t-shirt, you've got the seams all the way around. So you've got the ribbing at the top of the t-shirt. You can hide it right at the seam there and then run the cable along the seams to the shoulder, the shoulder seam and then uh, around the back seam for the sleeve and then down the side. So that makes it pretty easy to conceal, especially if it's a very form-fitting t-shirt. There's some thoughts. Hopefully those are useful for you. Kevin. Uh, Danny, what's the secret to getting my wife to manage my sound for me? Danny, that's for you. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. Okay. I, I'd have to think about it. I, for a I, have the, I know what the answer is. Kevin, pay your wife to do the job. Pay her. <laughs> Ask her if she wants a job. I mean, she probably doesn't, though. She, she might not. It's up to her. But um, I hope you're paying. hope you're offering to pay. That'd make a difference. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Kevin. When I run sound for Phil Kagey, I use Earthworks for him. He literally, uh, one of the best guitarists in the world. Check him out. Hmm. Earthworks, those are, that's substantially more expensive than a Samson CO1, just so that you're aware. Um, but, but yes, Earthworks makes amazing microphones. Clayton, is there a way to automate rewriting time code to your Rode Wireless Go audio recordings to match your mixed pre-time coded recordings in post? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, I, I think at that point you just sync using the waveforms, um, which any nonlinear editor app will do. I don't think there's a way to... Yeah, I mean, that's like a lot more work to accomplish the same thing as it, that you can accomplish with just syncing via the waveform. Like, right-click on the audio. Assuming you recorded scratch audio to your camera, um, then... Yeah, I'm not sure I follow, Clayton, why you'd want to do that. Maybe if the uh, the wireless signal dropped out, eh, even then, not, not quite seeing it. Yeah, I think you're, you're better off just syncing and post uh, with the waveforms. One last question. How to get more gain without noise? Your live stream sound is so amazing. Uh, you talk softly and you have distance, but it still has power. Um... Make a quiet space. That helps a lot. Um, micro, certain microphones do better than others, so we can actually let you hear a couple here. Um, let's mute the boom here. This is the Sennheiser MKH-416 now. I'm switched over to the Sennheiser MKH-416. It's just here out of the frame. Um, so that you can see what that's like. 
Uh, that's a little bit more distant than this microphone is, so it's going to sound different. Obviously, it obviously has a very different sound signature as well. I think it's getting the microphone as, as to a reasonable distance. Uh, this is a condenser microphone, so it's not like a Shure SM7B or other dynamic microphones, so it can, it can pick up a little farther away. Having a quiet space, so I have a sound blanket here, I have one on the table in front of me, I have another sound blanket there, I have another sound blanket between Danny and me. Just bumped this microphone, sorry about that. Actually, you didn't hear it. I've got a blanket on the floor, got a carpet or a little rug underneath me. So anything you can do to manage the sound and the reflected sound in your area. So um, we're doing pretty well here. We've got a, the light has a fan in it, but it's far enough away and I've got a huge, I wonder if I can actually show, let me show this to you. <laughs> I think I can do this. Danny, if you go to the overhead camera, So it's out of focus, but I can, can I focus it? There we go, a little better. So I've got a four by four up there in front of the, one of the aperture lights there. There's the camera and I've got my confidence monitor there. All right, come back to the main camera now. There's the sound blanket. You just saw the sound blanket there. Um, so managing any potential noise sources within your room is really important. Uh, managing reverberation with sound blankets or some other sort of acoustic treatment makes a huge difference. Um, getting relatively close to your microphone makes a good difference, a uh, big, big difference. Using a microphone that doesn't generate a lot of self noise and a uh, mixer or recorder that doesn't make a that doesn't generate a lot of self noise are the, the other things. Using quality cables. Those are all the secrets. That's it. That's all. Maybe there's some more, <laughs> but that's, that's the main stuff. So, all right. Thanks everybody for coming to our sound for video session. Oh, wait, 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 what was that? I didn't miss that one, Danny. Are we ending now? Uh, yeah. Cause there are a lot more questions. Well, just that, just that last one really quick. What was that last one I missed? And that last question was a super chat. Oh, let's get it. Well, no, the one you just answered. Oh, oh okay. Oh, but there was another one that was on screen just a second ago. That yes, is. there is. I'm not seeing it. Oh, there is. Okay. Can I use a power bank with a Zoom F8N Pro? No. No, you cannot. You have to use a um, like a Cine battery with a, a D-Tap to Hiroshi connector, but you can do that. So, okay. Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, get out there and make some great sound, and we will talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.